So we'll talk a little bit about some of the trends and challenges that are associated with the reuse in the industry, talk about what some of the things that we've been doing in the industry already, especially with regards to, you know, AutoSAR, et cetera, that really are standards that help with the reuse, but also where some of the pitfalls are there. Um, and then some of the potential that we're starting to see from additional manufacturers and how they're getting additional reuse and additional capability in this space and getting some real benefits from it. And that's what I'll show with a couple of the early indicators where we do have some clients who are already put, you know, positioning and stating, here's the type of return we get from a more strategic approach to a platform reuse within uh, electrical and electronics. So the first one, we've seen this kind of chart before. Uh, I think the only thing we can say is that we're, we're really seeing that accelerated curve happening real time right now. And you can really tell that some of these new functions that we have are really coming to bear very quickly. And it's even changing a lot of the business models that we see. I mean, when you talk to the infotainment team, I don't think three years ago anybody was predicting the level of of change that they were going to have and the adoption of real infotainment and consumer electronics type functions within the vehicle. And it's just really taken off to the point that a number of the infotainment providers, tier ones, are really considering themselves now more of a consumer electronic company versus an automotive supplier. So definite major changes within the environment here. And that curve also represents that, you know, how do I keep managing this environment? How do I do development differently? Because you can't possibly hire enough engineers to build that much code that you see coming and those requirements that you see coming. So reuse is one of those ways that we're looking at how can I greatly increase the productivity of the engineers without having to hire another 20,000 engineers that just don't exist. So some of the sophisticated software that we see in the vehicle is, is well understood. I, I think my, my point on this chart will be more along the lines of some of the systems in system engineering problems that are associated with reuse of the software and the EE system. And it's not just the integration of mechanical, electrical, and software that's some of the challenges that we see around this. It's also the integration between your own domains within automotive, between chassis, body, powertrain, et cetera. And if you notice on the system of systems, I mean, Paul had some, some comments on here with, with regards to autonomous vehicles and all. I don't know if any of you saw last week, uh, even Volvo Truck had an autonomous tractor trailer going through urban areas and urban traffic. I thought that was pretty brave. It's a little different than having a Prius on a highway, right? Um, they also showed in concert with Volvo cars the idea of trying to compress traffic. So they had a caravan of a tractor trailer in front, five vehicles behind it, and keeping very tight um, spacing between them through vehicle to vehicle communication. And it was more sophisticated than that, though. You also, they also had to have uh, camera systems on board to say, OK, I have a car pulling up to this caravan. They have their right turn signal on. I need to space out so the person can pull in and get to his exit as well. Because if you're going to do this kind of compression of the of the peer-to-peer uh, -peer network like that, you've got to take care of the cars that aren't part of that yet. You know, those are going to be on the road for a very long time. So some pretty interesting approaches to how they're managing that environment. And what's interesting now is that these new features that we're adding to the vehicle are really not in any one domain, right? We've been seeing that for a while. And in fact, we're finding that the plateau, we're seeing a plateau of the new features or devices that are being added to a vehicle. And we're seeing all of this new functionality really coming across from the existing devices, the existing ECUs that you have on board, the existing sensors and capabilities that you have on board in creating new functions. So an example here is on a security system. If you create a new security type system for the vehicle, it's likely that you have most of the functionality and most of the capability on the vehicle already. Right? So how do I create new functions that are going to support that type of environment? Now, with that, you're going to have some additional risk. We already know a lot of the issues around you know, the various complexity that we're seeing with whether it's warranty costs in this environment, different bugs that we're seeing, and recalls that we've seen in the industry. I think one of the interesting ones, though, is what we can predict is coming soon in the future from a security perspective. So from that example in the previous chart, there's been a, a number of university studies that have been done around uh, hacking into vehicles. Uh, the first round of them were largely uh, with gaining physical access to the vehicle. 
Um, the last one was actually a study that was mainly from remote access to the vehicle, including hacking through the cellular modem on the vehicle, gaining access to safety critical systems quite, quite quickly, in fact. Um, another example that they had was something as simple as what we might think is very safe from a, uh, a CD player, right? It only supports you know, the CD formats that you would put in your vehicle, so you're saying, oh, it's just MP3 files and WMA files and stuff like that that we could play. So what they did is they had modified a, w, uh, a, a, a WPA file to the point where it basically, when it was loaded in the system, it played itself, and it overloaded the buffers on the head unit, and it was a specially written piece of code that was then able to gain access to the CAN bus and send erroneous signals to the CAN bus. So even something as simple and, and seems as innocuous as a, you know, a WPA file or an MP3 file could certainly be used to gain some level of control on a vehicle. So pretty interesting piece, and for those of you who are already going through your CMMI audits, your SPICE audits, your, now your ISO 26262 audits, now you get one more audit to look forward to. Um, as the SAE is, actually has an embedded security group that's working on a standard, uh, one of the proposed standards will be something very similar to an ISO 262 uh, approach. So just like you have ASO levels for uh, safety critical functions, it would be ASO levels type thing assigned for uh, security critical uh, parts of the vehicle and development on the vehicle. So what are some of the things that we've seen to try and address some of the reuse? And I'll just give the first one I think is pretty, pretty obvious from a uh, mechanical perspective. Um, we've all seen that they've gone well beyond just component reuse and commodity council reuse so that I, you know, I'm, I'm buying a grade eight bolt not from 12 suppliers with 12 different cost points, but you know, we have it very well managed from a, uh, an overall commodity perspective on things like fasteners. Um, but we're also seeing now the idea of these platforms that are just absolutely global in nature, great scale uh, from a, a cost perspective that they're getting from benefits, from a mechanical perspective, um, definitely more efficient on the product development process, and just as important is the reuse of manufacturing lines. The fact that I can build a, a series of vehicles off of a single platform also often means that I can have the reuse of the manufacturing plant for multiple different purposes and multiple different vehicles. So significant, this has been a significant return in the industry in making it more effective. But this is a little different in the software world, which we'll continue to explore. So Autosar was one, is certainly an approach that has multiple different benefits that we would be looking for. Um, at the OEM level, I think initially there was even a lot of things that said, you know, cost was going to go down. I, I don't see that as part of the goals at any time in the near term right now. Just not getting the level of volume uh, from an OEM perspective to say that costs are coming down through uh, the use of Autosar. Um, there still is probably the biggest benefit is time to value, time to market, new features being able to be added much more quickly is probably still the number one item that we're seeing uh, you know, Autosar from a benefit from an OEM perspective. And I'd argue that that top benefit on the supplier one is absolutely not coming to bear today. Um, I don't know how many of you on the supplier side are now dealing with four different OEMs with four different versions of the Autosar standard that you have to support. So where is the Autosar standard when I have to support a 3, a 3.1, a 4, a 4.1, and there's four different streams of development within Autosar, and it's largely based upon you know, various uh, members of the Autosar community wanting something very specific for their company and getting it. Um, so now we have this proliferation of Autosar standards. So there's been some great things on Autosar. I'm not, not trying to slam it, but there's also you know, some real room for improvement. And it's a fairly low, it's a fairly discrete and component level type of set of specifications. It's not what something I would say is a very high level of reuse. Geneva is a little bit higher level, right? Here's the idea of a, of a runtime platform that is an, uh, it, you know, it, it is an open source platform for the infotainment environment. And you know, one of the main goals from an OEM perspective was to be able to really take the head unit and say, okay, now that's a commodity, because I'm just gonna put the Geneva stuff on top of there, I can buy it from anybody I want, changing some business models. So on the infotainment side, you see some of the suppliers have actually you know, decided to be, okay, I'm gonna do the hardware and I'm gonna do it very well. And I'm gonna do it high volume, low cost. And so they're embracing that. Some of the other ones are just dropping out of the hardware altogether and becoming a software company. And really just providing 
infotainment capabilities on top of Janini. So different levels of, of support, making different changes within the environment. Definitely a different approach than what Autosar has done there, right? Less standard-based, more about open source. Now, what this was meant to be able to do for us was to get a much better return on the investment of the engineering environment. So what you're seeing here is you know, the product investment up front. On your next iteration of that product, because I'm doing reuse of all these different components, I should have a lot lower overall development costs, and I should be able to get a quicker return as I get the product to market. And frankly, people want that bottom, that big delta at the bottom, and we're not seeing it today, right? We are seeing some level of return. It's a little delta on the top. And so what I'm going to try and talk about is with, with the reuse that we're seeing within the industry, what are some of the things that we can be doing to get a better, more desirable result on the reuse? So this is a chart I think only a marketing guy's mother could love, but I'll try and walk you through it. Um, what we have here is, is, an ex, is an attempt to really show that at the lowest levels of reuse, at this component level reuse, we are getting some return on it, and we're seeing some good things. Um, we actually see that, that lower granularity within an Autosar environment, a little bit higher level within the Geneva environment. There's a good, there is an impact of reuse. What we'd argue, especially from a systems engineering perspective, is that real reuse is associated with architectural reuse. And that's where we're going to spend some time. Because that's what you're doing on that hardware, on that platform from a mechanical perspective. I'm reusing that architecture multiple times. So what does that mean in the EE space is where we'll spend some time on that top area. The other thing that's a, a bit of a lesson learned is that when you go to reuse the architectures, it's very much more dependent upon the organization and their own best practices and their own business model, in fact, about what they are doing within the EE space. So a VW who does a lot more outsourcing of their software and of their ECUs than development in-house, well, they're going to have a different business model, an organizational model for reuse than, say, a General Motors who does a lot more in-house work. Okay. So the idea here with this logical architecture is to create some level of abstraction between your functions on your vehicle, your feature list, and the actual physical realization of it. So I can do this at a very low level place, such as we see here on the right, which is just a, an ABS example of showing what the logical design would be on, a, on an ABS system, and as well as I can use it all the way up at the to total vehicle level and show a complete logical architecture. And we're seeing some companies out there doing a nice job of this, really seeing results that include the reduction of ECUs on the vehicle, because what they're finding, once you start to look at your whole logical architecture, you're starting to understand that you have the same software function on multiple ECUs. You may not have even known it because you're buying it from multiple vendors and you're paying for that development multiple times. So now that I can do that and I can do more of a dynamic allocation of where that software goes on the vehicle, and I know it's going to work because I have the logical architecture designed, you have a lot more flexibility on how you are going to see the physical realization of that vehicle. So a number of different areas that we're seeing of just trying to remove the, that logical function from the physical reality. But to do this is not, it sounds kind of simple saying, hey, just put this level of abstraction in between. We find one of the first things that companies need to do is get their arms around the requirements. It sounds like that's a simple thing to say, uh, it's that people should be having this, but this is not common within the industry, not from a voice of the customer down there to making decisions about what that logical architecture should look like on the vehicle. All right? And there are many different ways to take a voice of the customer requirement and implement it. But too often what we do is we take the actual voice of the customer request and just give it directly to the engineer without thinking through what that requirement really meant. So one of those, for instance, is yeah, I'll, I'll pick on, on a Ford example for a second here. Um, you know, you've all seen the thing carrying the bags of groceries out there, you go up behind your car and you, you wiggle your foot underneath the, the, the lift gate to get it to open. Um, I, I can't believe that was the only option that's there, right? I mean, if you're in Detroit in the wintertime, you got your mother-in-law with uh, you know, two hip replacements already, I can't imagine that's a good idea in the sun, uh, you know, out there in the ice and snow, right? Are there other ways that you had, even with 
your existing technology that was on the vehicle to accomplish the same thing. I could have a switch on my, on my car fob, on my key fob there, that would actually say, okay, when I get close to the car, and within, you know, within, you know, we already have on the car, right, all of the idea of how close the key fob is to different parts of the vehicle. So we already know that. You have that type of analysis on the vehicle. If you stand there for two seconds behind the rear bumper, let's go ahead and open the lift gate form. There are multiple different ways to solve the same problem, but we're not doing a good job of capturing and, and really elicitating what that requirement was from the voice of the customer. And I can create the wrong things, which isn't going to help anybody from a, a reuse perspective if I'm not actually understanding in the first place what we are trying to accomplish. And really this flows all the way through. So when I'm talking about a, a logical architecture here, the one piece that most companies are doing quite well within automotive is describing their feature tree, their functional architecture, whatever you want to call it, right? We do that pretty well, and we understand where that functional, that's the one piece of the logical architecture that we actually understand and are doing. In most cases, what we're seeing within the automotive industry is taking a function, that feature list, and telling an engineer to go design it. He's going to go put together some models. He's going to put together some algorithms. He's going to give it to procurement, they're going to go out there and find a supplier to build that ECU form, that new function. And we're not spending the time to understand where it fits in in a logical architecture, where I might already have some of those functions and capability to solve the particular requirement in the first place. Because often those engineers really have no idea where that requirement came from and how it was elicited in the first place. Was it really a, a, a holistic approach to it? I've been in many meetings, for instance, where uh, I'll see an electrical engineer will be, you know, chastising some other department within the company, like hybrids, and said, why didn't they do these trade studies and understanding, you know, that, you know, because I have a plug-in hybrid, I better have better insulation in the vehicle, even though it's more weight, so that in the wintertime, I'm not sucking up all of the energy just in heating the cab. And the bottom line is, your hybrid team, your plug-in hybrid team, they did that trade study but they have no visibility to it within the rest of the organization. So part of this reuse is making sure that the top level requirements become that next person's design, who's that design now goes down to the logical guy who's doing the logical architecture. That system engineer is, now creates that as his requirement. And as he goes and he creates the physical architecture, that now is you know, his design element, which is the next person's requirement. So this flow down is very important to get it right. It's something that we are fairly immature in automotive compared to in other industries, such as med devices and telecom, as well as aerospace. And one of the, the key items that you, you see is you start to think about where, where does that reuse come from, from an architectural perspective. It's really the systems engineers who are responsible for that. And we don't even have discipline of system engineering consistently in our organizations today. Um, and it, what's really critical here is, is I think this bottom comment from multiple customers where sometimes this is given to the software group and say, software, you fix this reuse thing. It's not a software issue. It's truly a systems engineering issue. It's a system problem, and it needs to be held up at a higher level. Okay. So sounds okay, all right, not, not too hard to create some sort of a logical idea of how I can you know, allocate information on the vehicle. But there's actually a number of complexities that make this fairly difficult to implement. Um, so I make it kind of sound maybe a per, per, you know, too simple at first. We do have to take into consideration all the variant points that you have in the system. Not only the variant points, but then also it, that this is happening over a time frame. And I'm gonna have different baselines, I'm gonna have different model years. This is, becomes a very complex space, and as many of those other variant points that you have on the vehicle, whether it's localization, trim lines, different products, um, each of those becomes a new dimension in the space. So you can have a six-dimensional problem here very quickly with a very realistic approach um, of trying to manage this space. It's difficult to pull off from an overall configuration management perspective. And really what you're getting to when you look at this, is how do I understand which requirement is going against which product design, which is going against which design artifacts, and which one do I group all together that's going to be that release for that new product that goes out the door? 
It's a very complex environment. This is one of the pieces that we've been using and spending a lot of time with an IBM, and Paul mentioned the OSLC. It's one of the ways that we're linking the information from multiple different systems to allow this type of visibility and understanding of finding the right information for the right ECU for the right architecture that you're looking for. So just think of asking your organization, how easy is it for you to find all the different design artifacts and requirements associated with a single ECU? Sounds like a simple request. Most companies would not be able to find this in, in a week or two weeks, and even if they did, they're going to not know if they have the right version for the right product line for the right model year. Okay. So one of the things we're doing with partners on, on this space as well is really looking at how we can pull information through this OSLC standard to take information from multiple different disciplines and tie it together such it, in, in the context of the configuration with the right timing, the right version control, et cetera. And a couple of things that we're doing in this space is trying to organize the data in a way that makes sense to you. So you want to be able to visualize it based upon the feature tree. You might want to be able to visualize all the information based upon the physical structure. Okay? So multiple different ways or viewpoints of looking at the information. And then also being able to analyze that information. It's one thing to say, hey, great, now I know exactly you know, what are all the different components and design artifacts that are associated with the particular ECU I'm looking for but I'm not able to go in and necessarily and do an impact analysis. Can I also say, show me everything that's not completed from an ISO 262 perspective on a particular program. So reporting, impact analysis, if I make a change on this requirement, where else is this being used? What other programs are going to be affected by this? So just being able to manage all that complexity is a big piece of the problem that, that OSLC, as Paul mentioned, is something that we're working on, and it includes one of the first things we found with clients as we get, went down this path is that the financial data is something they want to see very quickly, mainly cost information around piece parts so they can understand whether their cost targets are being met, not just program targets from a, uh, a timing perspective. So cost and, and also having the integration even into an SAP system is something that's very important to be able to pull real-time information on where we are. So a couple of, first of all, it's, it's kind of difficult to get car companies to share financial information, if you haven't noticed that, right? Uh, nobody wants to give, you know, cost data and everything. So it's been interesting trying to get some, some real numbers, and we're still working with customers on, on uh, de-blinding some of the information that they've, they've been able to give us to date. Um, some of the early indicators on, on where we're seeing, I'm missing a slide. One of the first ones I'll, I'll talk about then is... Um, is Volvo Truck had, a, had an interesting one where they are, it, think about you know, how custom truck cabs are, right? When you're dealing with the semi-tractor trailers. Especially in the United States, everybody has a very different variant and they're, they're highly customized, engineered to order vehicles typically. Um, within Volvo Truck, they have, have a single EE architecture that they're using across all their different truck lines. And it's pretty wide what you're talking about there, right? You have some people who practically live in their cabs. You know, there are uh, microwaves and everything else in the back of a, of a tractor trailer, right? So what are they going, you know, how do they get that entire vehicle under one architecture? They spend a lot of time dealing out with that logical architecture, spending the time to understand how they can allocate all the various features along there and take some of it away for the lower end trucks that don't have the long haul capabilities. Um, so kind of a modular single EE architecture across all of their vehicles. They've done the same thing even within uh, their construction equipment line. And there are some things that are very much in common within the construction side, such that you know, the cabs are fairly similar and the controls for, uh, for HVAC, et cetera, if it's a closed cab, are very similar. And they've kind of built out a domain model that shows where are all the reuse possibilities across all of their different divisions and across all their different product lines. Um, on top of that, they've created a single continuous software build. So they have one software build across all their vehicle lines for that EE architecture. Okay. Pretty, pretty impressive where, where they've gone with it, compare, you know, considering all the complexity they have with uh, build to order. The other one that we saw it, that I'll, I'll mention here, and those are some results from General Motors, where they published uh, it, basically from their powertrain team over the last eight years, they've been doing a single common architecture 
in that environment and a single software build across their engines globally. They're managing the variations on those engines through CALs, right? So everything's built into it. And one of the key elements that, that GM talks to is e even when they're designing the simplest piece of electronic software, they're dealing with it with all of the different variants in mind. So the first time they go out and buy a cruise control switch, they want to design it and order it with all of the different options that you could think of. It's going to be a 5-volt control system, a 12-volt control system. I need to design the software such that it will work on a sliding switch on the column as well as a push-button switch on the steering wheel. So support for all of those different variants the first time out. And one thing that was interesting when, uh, when they were presenting this uh, in front of a live audience was a couple of suppliers were saying, well, this is more expensive. This is hard for us to do. And their, their answer is yes, it is hard. Yes, it is more money. It's definitely more money on the upfront process. And uh, what GM's findings are, though, is that the return is more than worth it, right? They're seeing three to five X productivity gains on next iterations. So if we're looking at how am I going to gain, you know, how am I going to get through that big complexity curve, they're really showing that the reuse is a huge way of gaining the engineering time to do additional work, right? Now, it was also interesting, it wasn't just from a, uh, a productivity savings. They're also showing that their warranty costs went down by 70%. Now, you can't claim all of that is from reuse, but it's certainly a large part of it. Um, they certainly claim it's a large part of it. Not only that, but uh, you'll see that they're, during that process, they've found more bugs earlier in the process because that code is everywhere, right? Bad news is when you do have a problem, it's everywhere, right? But overall, they've seen a tremendous uh, change on, on what that warranty reduction is. And, and really what GM's approach was is something that you, know, you need to look at. I, I see very different models within automotive. Some uh, are never going to get to this level of saying it's a single build. There are trade-offs on this, and it's some hard engineering work to decide you know, how many architectures do I need to support, or do I want to build one modular architecture, which I can take ECUs away from, but I have a superset that I understand from day one. So different companies are going to have different approaches to that, you know, one for a luxury vehicle, one for maybe their lower end vehicle. Um, and it's also being applied at, at the, we see it more and more applied at the tier ones. You know, you'll have a platform approach and you're actually building the variants for your various OEMs that you're supplying to. So I put it all into one system. And what that means is there, there are times where you're going to be giving General Motors a piece of functionality in the code that's turned off by cows that they didn't order. And you know what? If they order it, then you can just turn it on through changing the cows in the, in the licensing form, right? So there, there are good benefits even at the, at the Tier 1 level that we're seeing hitting as well. I think the one other item that we, we found in some of the surveys we've been doing in this space that was a, a trend that is not addressed in the, in the GM information here or, or in the Volvo one, is that what's the payback, all right? We're talking payback from an engineering productivity perspective here. That's very quick. First iteration, three to five X savings is pretty good. What does that mean, though, when I'm looking at the investment of the build process, the manufacturing process, everything else that you have to deal with, and the procurement process that's clearly more expensive when I'm buying some of those parts up front? And pretty much the number across the board from multiple industries was if you're not building something that's going to be iterated on and, and having new versions of at least three times, it's probably not worth doing. The payback is two and a half to three times for doing a, a complete reuse project. Right? So pretty, pretty common across the industry, both in for everything from an aerospace model to an automotive model to a supplier model, is very similar. 